And my sister, I basically said to her, I'm really sad that my niece won't remember me. And sort of hinting towards suicide. And she said to me, do you think that I would let her forget you? You know that um, my daughter means everything to me. And you mean everything to me. And I would never let her forget you, even if you hurt yourself, because I will always love you. And my love is not contingent upon you being here. He was validating, Justin, I know that you are in this deep, deep pain. And I don't want you to take on this burden of like living for us. It sounds very like it's promoting suicide, but it's completely did the exact opposite. She's forgiving me for doing this horrible thing that I have so much guilt about having even attempted suicide. That's so beautiful. Welcome to Spread the Light, where we use the power of our own stories of living with mental illness to dispel stigma and stereotypes, and instead spread hope and light. I'm your host. You know me well by now. I'm Dr. Devika Bhushan. I'm a pediatrician, a public health practitioner, an immigrant to the U.S. by way of India and the Philippines, a toddler parent, and somebody who lives with bipolar disorder. Today, I want to welcome a very special guest, Dr. Justin Bullock. He is a nephrology fellow at the University of Washington. He's a speaker, writer, researcher, and activist, and he lives openly with bipolar disorder. He was actually the brave soul who most inspired me to share my story last year, as I've shared on this podcast previously. And so he's just been a delight and inspiration, and now I'm lucky to call him a friend. Welcome to the show, Justin. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much for having me. It's always a joy and honor whenever I get to speak with you. So a lot of people who are listening will know you and your story well, but just for anybody who hasn't happened on your story yet, do you mind giving us a sense of the broad brushstrokes of your mental health journey, how it started and where you are now? So I would say my journey with mental illness begins actually with my family because I have a pretty extensive family history of mental illness. My dad has bipolar disorder, and he's actually in prison, really related to his bipolar not being well-treated, my grandfather has schizophrenia, etc. And as I was growing up, I think I still thought that mental illness was kind of this thing that people sort of made up when they made up excuses, like if they got in trouble, like my dad who got in trouble. So there's a lot of kind of judgment, sort of stigma, I think, within myself and, um, you know, within my community. And... When I was in high school, I'm gay, I came out to my family, and that didn't go very well, and um, actually attempted suicide, kind of aftermath of all of that. And at that point, I was diagnosed with a mild depression, but really didn't get any mental health care after that. And then on to college, where I had my first, what I'd say was a real long, de like, depressive episode. You know, I started doing therapy, and it took me a very long time on this journey until I was ready to take medicine. And eventually I did, and I found I got so much better. And you know, continuing on to medical school, I had actually stopped the antidepressants that I was taking in college under the guidance of my psychiatrist to just kind of see how things went. Um, and I had another episode of depression, but this time when I took my same meds that I'd taken before, I started to get very sped up. And I had periods where my sleep you know, started at like eight hours and was to a point where I was only sleeping 90 minutes at a, at a time. You know, I was kind of very angry and impulsive, basically starting to show the signs that I had bipolar disorder. That diagnosis, I have bipolar 2, which often is a very tricky diagnosis to make because a lot of times a bipolar person looks like a doctor, like someone who's in medicine, who's being very productive at times and is really kind of goal-oriented. And then the depressed episodes, we often hide. You know, since that time, I would say overall I'm doing a lot better, but I've had a lot of challenges along the way until I've attempted suicide three times in my life. Some of them have been very, very serious. I would also say along the way, I started sort of sharing my story of living with bipolar disorder. And I found that so many people share in some aspect of my lived experience with mental illness, either for themselves directly, for a family member. And kind of in this process of sharing, I feel like I, I try to turn this bipolar, which is often a thing of a lot of suffering, into a gift something that helps me connect with people. I think it definitely helped me connect with patients. You know, now I'm a fellow in nephrology and even in kidney medicine, the topic of mental illness comes up so much. So yeah, 
that was my baseline journey, a little bit of myself. Thank you for sharing all of those pieces. And I'm curious, you spoke about initially having this uh, great deal of stigma around bipolar disorder in general, given um, your experiences relative to your father, and then coming to a place where you were comfortable enough with the diagnosis for yourself to then be public about the experience that you had. And I'm curious how that journey occurred for you and what it took to get you to that point of comfort um, with your diagnosis with yourself to be able to be open about it. I very much believe that I need therapy. I need medicine. Those are sort of the baseline, like fundamentals for me to just be a kind of functional, like the Justin that I want to be. I, I always feel that for me, meds, what they do is they turn down the intensity of my symptoms. And then therapy is where I'm able to like process and work through things and, you know, interrogate like the traumas and stigma that I have within myself. And for a long time, I've had this history of hurting myself. And one day my therapist said something to me along the lines of your father, when he gets very angry, he hurts other people. You, when you get very angry, you hurt yourself. And that combined with talking with family, understanding a little bit more of my like dad's experience, because, you know, when he's in prison, we get these 15 minute phone calls. I've gone to see him in person in prison, but I don't really get them the opportunities to actually like understand his journey or his experience. And so I think all those things together helped me to first find compassion for him as a human who's imperfect and who's suffering, but also to see those things reflected in myself. And in, in the end, I actually feel more connected to him. And we have a imperfect relationship and, you know, we're both people, but forgiving him allows me to sort of forgive myself somehow or like accept myself. I remember one night in the hospital where I still wasn't sleeping and I was very highly medicated, but still not sleeping at night and just like really just crying and very sad and just suffering. And there was um, a nurse who was taking care of me. So we're in this dark room, doors closed. And I remember this thought that flashed in my mind, which was basically, she couldn't stop me if I wanted to kill myself. I could kill her if I wanted to. Um, and it was this type of thought that like, I have never had in my life before. It caused a lot of distress in me the moment that I had it because it was like, I felt like this monster, this absolutely horrible person. And part of it was reflecting that like I was unwell and I was, my reality was kind of breaking down. I was so, in so much pain that I was desperate for anything that could make the pain stop. Those moments are not ones that are comfortable to share because they don't sort of sync with who I know Justin to be. And in that moment, that was what I was thinking and experiencing. And I think there's like really being confronted with moments like those, for me, it allows me to have more empathy for my father who like hurt my mom, who hurt other people. And it doesn't sort of take away like the, I am responsible for my own actions and mental illness is real. It was your unwell self, but it was still yourself. Yeah. I mean, that's so relatable for anyone who has experienced not being themselves in some way or another. And when we look back at that, we are sometimes in the moment, just like you said, horrified that our brains are, are enabling us to go to a place that we never thought we could go to. And then when we look back, it's a struggle to sync ourselves, our sense of who we are with that narrative and that moment and those several moments usually. That's one of the hardest things about being unwell in this way, for sure. I completely agree. And it's, it's crazy because like, even as I think back to the moment now, like it still makes me want to cry because I think about like, how much pain that like Justin had to be in and that to experience that thought. And I feel so lucky because I don't feel that right now, you know? And of course I have this fear that maybe that pain is gonna come back at some point. But like, I'm grateful that in this moment right now, I don't have it. And that's a lot. And I'm grateful that, you know, you're here, that you had um, so many close calls and you are just such an incredible person and for you to, to be here with us today, I'm just really grateful for that as well. I'm curious, as you look back and you're saying, you can know, 
you have so much empathy for Justin in that moment. What would you tell yourself knowing everything you know about your journey and about everything it took to get to this point? What's one message you might want to send yourself back in that moment or another really hard moment? I love these questions. I usually do not cry during interviews. I'm like, I'm grateful for, for you to make me feel safe to do this. If I could go back and tell myself something, it would be that your pain is real. There were times I, I did not believe that things would ever get better because I feel like I had done everything. I was exercising as much as possible. You know, I was taking my meds. I was doing therapy three times a week. I was trying really hard to be positive and have used all these skills that people have taught me and all this stuff. And I was still suffering. And I think mental illness, for, for me, it makes me feel very isolated and that other people don't sort of under, understand my experience, that your pain is real. The story that I tell often, which really was one of the most meaningful mental health interactions I've ever had, was with my sister. This had been probably after at two suicide attempts. My family had really seen like the dark side of my mental illness because I did a really good job of hiding it from them. But then they saw me after. And, you know, most people think like after you survive suicide attempt, it's this process of like happy healing where things just get better. And for me, I was just like so unwell that I really went into an even darker place than I was before the attempt. And that was like, first for me, that was unfathomable. And my family, they saw me like hurting. This person who's normally has this like bright energy, someone who's like very positive and like happy and like a squirrel, you know, has a ton of energy, it was just very unwell um and my sister i basically said to her like this is a few years later i, I was given to another episode of depression and i said i'm really sad that my niece like, won't remember me and sort of hinting towards attempting suicide and she basically said to me do you think that i would let her forget you and every single time that i think about that story i feel so happy and so grateful for my sister in that moment, because to me, what she was doing was she was validating my suffering. That Justin, I've seen you suffer for years and I don't fully understand the pain, but I know that you are in this deep, deep pain. And I don't want you to like take on this burden of living for us because you fought, you fought for, you know, and it, and it was this weird thing where it, it sounds very like it's promoting suicide, but it, it like completely did the exact opposite because I think she was really like saying, Justin, I love you. I love you no matter what. Like, you know that my daughter means everything to me and you mean everything to me. And I would never let her forget you, even if you hurt yourself because I love you and I will always love you. And my love is not contingent upon like you being here. I will love you no matter what. And that is just this like, there is no textbook that says to do that. And that was like the absolute correct thing for me in that moment. That's so beautiful. And she knows you deeply inside and out. She knew what you needed to hear in that moment. And that was it. We reflect on it since then. And She's even said, when I said that in that moment and I truly meant it, that's when I knew that I like loved you in a different way than I like ever understood that I did. Yeah. Because she's forgiving me in this moment for doing this horrible thing that I have so much guilt about having even attempted suicide. I carry so much guilt because I've been willing to hurt my family because I felt weak. And looking back at these experiences now, do you still carry guilt around it? Or is that part something that you've resolved? I definitely still hold some guilt. I think that I've done a lot of work to try and help understand it and sort of show myself compassion. You know, another story related to this was this, this second suicide attempt. It was really the worst one by, of, of, of all of them by quite a lot. And ultimately, I ended up calling my therapist like, quite far into the attempt. And basically, when I called him, it was in the middle of the night, he didn't answer. But then he called me back, like within one or two minutes. And I was like unconscious within five minutes of this phone call. And obviously, I lived, but I always have felt so much guilt because, you know, for me, it's like if he didn't answer that phone, 
then he would have had to live the rest of his life with my life on his hands. And I always, I felt horrible for doing it, but you know, I think he saw that was unwell. He really tried to lay the ground of like, Justin, I want you to call me. And I think some people will say that, but then they don't actually want you to call them. And that actually is, that's harmful when someone is unwell. But, you know, we've talked about it since then. And, you know, for him, I gave him this like incredible gift because he had the opportunity to save me. Um, I'm very confident that had he not called back in that time or had I not called him, that I would have died because of the intensity of the attempt. And but he saved me and that's this gift and, and it is a gift. Yeah. And so it's holding this very complicated thing where it's like, the only way that he could save me is if I took a risk with him and knew that there were potentially like harmful sort of consequences. And like, I think there are so many people who have who lost loved ones who wish that they just had the chance to save their loved ones. To me, this is a message both to people suffering and to loved ones of sufferers that I am happy that I made that call. And it took me a really long time to feel that way, like probably years after. And for loved ones to tell people, if they mean it, that they want you to reach out to them like in time of emergency. And obviously people need their mental health specialists and experts and medicines and all these things. But sometimes you need someone who just won't judge you, who you can just call when you're in the darkest and scariest of places. That's incredible. I've heard you speak about that moment, you know, in a couple of forums and the relationship that you have with your ex-therapist is just so beautiful and so poignant. And the fact that, you know, it took I think six years or so, right, for you all to develop that kind of a depth and and trust and safety with each other and kind of bi-directionally. But it sounds like there was also the, this long process that you undertook of, of forgiving yourself for putting that on him in that moment. And it's beautiful that you were able to get there. And I'm also curious if you have advice, you know, for friends or family members of somebody who is struggling with suicidal thoughts and deep depression, what are the right ways to show up in those moments? Psychiatric hospitalizations are extremely, you lose all of your agency. Um, and, you know, for me, it's like one day I'm a doctor. I'm ordering like meds for people. I'm putting in central lines, being a doctor. And then you go into a psych hospital and you don't get to decide about anything about yourself. And that is hard. It's bad. It's not fun. It, I know that there are times in my life where I need to be in a hospital. And I think a lot about how can we make those moments less traumatic? And how can we try to minimize reinflicting additional trauma? And one thing that I have started, now I've talked with my, my partner about this, and you know, I've given this advice to many people, is there are times when we can tell that people's mental health is heating up and that you're sort of approaching potentially a hospitalization. And one thing that I encourage people to do is to talk with someone and say, you know, if we think that you need to be admitted to a hospital, who would you want to go with you to the hospital? I think that most people, there may be some resistance early on, but I think that if you really were asking with an open, like, I want to know who you want to be with you, I think it's really powerful because you're saying like, we're going with you. We are not abandoning, you know, we're not like sending you to this place and like getting rid of you. And we want you to have the ability to decide who goes with you. So for, instance, for me, I never would want my partner to be the person who like called 911 or like sent me to the hospital because it would just, for me, it would be really damaging to our relationship. I would always want him to call one of my mental health providers and for them to then make that decision and make the call. With my old therapist, he was a person who, he took me to the hospital more than once and I wasn't always happy with him, but it was always done in a way that like, I felt some sense of agency, even if I didn't really have a choice, you know, he would say, I really, really, really like, do not want to call. I'm one more, you know? And, and part of that is I'm a black man and he was very conscientious of the implications of any type of potential law enforcement or EMS getting involved and how that could potentially be lethal for me. 
which is a whole separate conversation. But yeah, um, that's one thing. I think giving people agency, you know, asking the question, like, you know, we're getting worried about you. If we thought you needed to go to the hospital, like, who would you want to go with you? You know, everyone is on their different journey of how much they accept that they have mental illness, how much they can recognize that they're doing unwell. I think most people know when they're suffering, like when you're depressed, most people know that they're not happy. And so I think somehow if you can anchor on this, like you're suffering right now, I think most people would sort of pretty openly admit that and use that as the kind of the, the point that you're sort of building off with the bipolar spectrum. You know, when people are sped up, sometimes it's a little bit harder to recognize those things because like when I'm sped up, I feel good. Usually my life is going pretty well. I'm doing research, I'm publishing papers, you know, I'm getting cool opportunities to talk. I'm having a lot of energy. I'm running a ton. I'm doing really great training. I'm probably getting in good shape, lifting, all these things. I feel good. I will say this again and again, I very much believe in the importance of having mental health professionals who you trust. You know, bipolar is a disease where for some people, and I would say for me, sometimes there are times where reality kind of starts to break down a little bit. And... If you don't have someone that you trust before reality starts breaking down, it's like really, really hard. Your reality is breaking down. And so you don't know what you can trust. You know, I really try to push people to, because if you have bipolar disorder, you need professional help. And this is all my opinion, obviously. I fully believe in empowering people to like, you know, I'm someone who I read a lot of things. I try to look at things that I read, you know, but like there are parts of my life that are greater than I'm able to sort of manage on my own. And having a team of people so for me, I think that's the only reason I'm still alive. So it sounds like a lot of it is around making advanced plans for what would happen were you to walk through a really difficult time. And in a time where you're, maybe your reality, as you said, was breaking down, where it was really hard to trust people, you know, in that moment to actually have in, in place a specific protocol even of like, this person is going to call the ambulance or the hospital and, and help me get admitted if this or this other thing were to transpire. I think that's really, really, really important and smart, especially for somebody with a serious mental illness where you do have moments where things are less connected with reality, right? And it's hard in those moments to conceptualize of these plans. And, you know, thinking about what it takes for you to stay well, right? Like not to be up or down and to be in this very stable place, especially as you're walking through super busy professional time, you know, residency, now fellowship, being active in research, having an active social life, doing a lot of speaking events. Like what are your parameters and what are your must do's to stay well through all of that? The first is for me to truly be honest with myself and know that you know i'm aiming for this band middle range band and i have a cyclical mood condition so i have times where i go above and below that band for me accepting that allows me to then sort of continually self-reflect and think about am i in that band am i like a little bit sped up my sleep is kind of cutting down like you know, it, because it's, it's hard because we live life and good things and bad things happen in life and they can make us go up and down just naturally. And so the question is always, I think most bi bipolar people would say this, there's a lot of time we spend self-checking of asking, you know, am I okay? Am I sped up? Am I sad? And so first just acknowledging that there are some natural variations. There's also sometimes you're like, hmm, I'm not sleeping and I've been like super focused at work more than normal and I'm running a ton. So these things have now added up to where I'm probably not just like feeling a little bit good. Something's probably going on. And so it's a, it's a constant process of checking in. And usually I'm the first person to know. I know before my doctors know. I know before my boyfriend knows. Do you really believe so much in the importance of the environment that I'm in? That is so fundamental because it shapes my safety to ask for help when I need it. I've been very open about the fact that I had a less than ideal time in residency related to my bipolar. And that was very hard for me because I didn't feel like I could be truly honest about when I was struggling. And to me, that feels dangerous. You know, I tried very, very hard to make sure that my mental health does not impact my patient care. But when you're afraid to ask for help, that's very risky for anyone. You know, we were just talking about sort of contingency planning I feel very lucky because I get to be out every day about being bipolar. Like it's not something that I hide. 
And I know that most people don't have that experience. But for me, when I started fellowship, I sat down with my PD and I was like, okay, you know, I had this rough time before. I want to make a plan now before anything happens that we can talk about. If you're worried about me, this is what you're going to do. If I'm worried about me, this is what I'm going to do. Like, this is our plan. And really having a very, very clear, explicit plan before. And I think what that does, it makes everyone feel safer because they're like, you know, they knew that I was bipolar coming in. So like, you know, we know that Justin's bipolar. They're, the people, the people have worries about that, but we have a plan. And it's nice because then if someone's not following their end of the plan, we didn't sign a contract or do anything like that, but then we have an agreed like limits. And I, I fully recognize that I am in a sort of special position because I felt safe to like do that. And I hope we move towards a medicine where everyone feels safe to do that. So there's the environment. And then, you know, like for me, exercise is a very big thing. I'm a big runner, you know, running consistently. Interestingly, lately, that's meant me being kind to myself when I don't run. Because I, some, I sometimes have made it into this thing where like, I have to run six days a week. Otherwise, you know, there's all these things. And sometimes my body is like, I'm older than I was when I was 21. Now I'm 30. You know, that may, may not sound that, that old, but to me, that feels older. And like, my knees hurt sometimes. And like, I need to take some days off. And like, there's obviously a limit where I need to exercise so much to feel good. But, you know, and then sleep for any bipolar person is like the most fundamental thing. Fortunately, I, my partner is very sleep sensitive. And so if I don't sleep enough, then he doesn't sleep enough. And if he doesn't sleep enough, then I know about it. And so he's like my <laughs> permanent check. And then, yeah, I guess I do therapy. I'm right now, I'm actually upping to twice a week because I'm in research time and have, and I'm actually maybe going to go up to three times a week at some point, just because it really turns up the heat on therapy and you can make more progress because you're spending less time updating and more time kind of therapying with each session. And then meds. I take meds every single day. I hate taking medicines. I take lithium and Seroquel and it kind of changes with, you know, depending on what's going on, but like I have side effects from medicines and I also know that they are very, very important to me to staying where I am. Thank you for listing all of those out and giving us a sense of really what your playbook looks like, but also what happens when you're edging into those red flag symptoms, right? Of starting to be a little bit revved up what, and, and how you recognize that for yourself and dial things up probably to help you come back to a place where you're healthy and safe. I want to focus a little bit on, you know, a chapter of your life, which you may revisit with some dismay or consternation, but if you could give us a, a little bit of a flavor of the bureaucratic and very overbearing system to which you returned after your suicide attempt in residency and what that experience looked like for you. So to lay the context, so it was my first year of residency. My suicide attempt actually happened right as COVID was sort of ramping up, but it was unrelated to COVID for me. And I'd actually been doing very well during my first year of residency. I got this like teaching award and I felt like I was doing really well clinically. And I say that because I thought that as long as I was a good doctor, that it didn't matter if I was bipolar, that I would be protected because I just did a good job at work. And I attempted suicide. It happened outside of work. I called 911 myself and you know, I was hospitalized, I did a sort of month-long treatment program. And when I tried to come back to work, first I had to do this very invasive and kind of very traumatic assessment where they like, you know, drug tested me and made me release all of my psychiatric records. This really, for me, for like interrogation, the goal was to uncover all aspects of trauma of my life, like ask me about being sexually assaulted as a child and all these things that I felt didn't involve my workplace at all. And that happened and that was traumatic in and of itself. But then after, when there was evidence that I'd done nothing wrong, that there was no concerns, I'd ever been sort of compromised in any way at work. And I still had to sign this very sort of punitive contract and had to have monitoring. I had like a physician mentor who was monitoring me at work that I was forced to check in with. And there was this like a therapist who, who I have nothing against this therapist, but um, I called him my probation officer um, because I, I also had to check in with them. And one of those things where like, when you're being constantly monitored, that is not a safe place to sort of process or talk about anything that's actually challenging. Um, then, you know, for me, there was always this fear of if I made any mistakes, I felt like I would lose my license. I felt like they were just waiting. And there was no one who ever said this to me, but my experience of this was like, they were just waiting for me to make a mistake so that they would have something to pin on my bipolar and then get rid of me. And in that time, you know, I was just very 
angry and I was very vocal and I was very fortunate to have a lot of support and found that like, you know, the thing formerly known as Twitter was very powerful in connecting me with people and sort of understanding that this experience that I had was in no way unique, that there are hundreds and hundreds of people across the country for whom this is happening to right now. In that time, I really feel like I went into this Justin of sort of just trying to preserve who I was and not really being able to like shine in the way that I like normally like. Yeah, absolutely. And you spoke about not feeling safe, really reaching out for help when maybe in moments you felt you like you wanted it or needed it. And, you know, that's the piece that for the th hundreds to millions of um, clinicians who are being monitored in this punitive and counterproductive way around the country and around the world, that's the piece that, you know, people don't always recognize. They think that they're making the system and any eventuality safer by doing all of this over intensive monitoring. I mean, I had the same experience in medical school where I was assigned a physician coach through like a physician health services program after my diagnosis of bipolar disorder. And I had to actually have my therapist and psychiatrist who were treating me write letters to say, this is actually going to pose the risk of making this person unwell again, because they have to take time out of their very busy clinical schedule where they've just gotten back to a full rotation capacity and they have a lot of work to make up. And for them to have to spend three hours with you every week <laughs> doesn't make any sense. It's not therapeutic. It's not helpful from a monitoring standpoint. And luckily those letters worked, but not everybody has, you know, the wherewithal or the, the tools to put those kinds of countermeasures into place. But really we shouldn't need to amass an army of like countermeasures. I, I completely, completely agree. And, you know, I think there, one of the things that I found myself faced with as a resident was like, it was so intimidating because there was this huge, powerful university that I was trying to fight. And I didn't have any money for a lawyer to fight for me. And I didn't know who to talk to or to advocate for. But in these meetings, the institution had lawyers that were meeting with me. And there was really this huge, massive power imbalance. I recently talked with some sort of governmental lawyers who are very interested in this topic of physician mental health and risk factors for physicians completing suicide, et cetera. I trained was in California and I'm not in California anymore, but you know, the state of California used to house these physician health programs. Now, basically the individual institutions hold them. And the problem with that is to make a court case to sue a given institution, people often will rely on multiple individuals who have, you know, a shared experience in order to really create any meaningful change. And when that's housed by the state, you obviously have more people who can speak to one single institution. But when people are spread out in all these different institutions, um, you know, if every institution just has one person who they did this to, then there's never really a strong enough voice. And you have to have people who want to come forward, who live through the trauma, who are willing to engage in these things. There's like so many barriers. And basically there's this huge legal hurdle to creating meaningful change because this is so spread out across the country or the state. And every state has kind of a, its own rules. And so it's a little bit different in different places. For me, that was very sad because, you know, like they would hear my case, and, you know, they, there's a very specific type of case that will allow them to bring things forward and make meaningful change. And that's hard. Yeah, to silo these kinds of um, cases in this way makes it actually much, much harder for people to have collective bargaining and um, come together and ask for something different. Okay, one final question, which is, how do you see your mental health journey as having molded your unique superpowers? I think if I were to give myself one superpower, it's that I care so much about creating teams, fostering teams, and everyone feeling a part of the team. When I think back of like different teams through time, it matters to me so much. What I would say my bipolar has given me is, one, it's been extremely humbling because I've been fortunate to be very successful in life and get to go to all these cool academic institutions and yada, 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 all these things. And bipolar doesn't care. It's very humbling. It just like, it'll chop you down. If you need someone to chop you down, bipolar will do it. But people always say like, if you don't believe that you could be exactly where your patients are, you shouldn't be serving those patients. And I feel like bipolar has really helped me to understand what that means and really try to hold that. And I think the last thing is also just to really know that there's no one face of suffering. That like when you look at the people who are on your teams, 
sometimes the people who seem like they have it all together are struggling. And it's not these, mar these normal sort of metrics of success that determines whether or not someone's struggling. Oftentimes, especially if someone tells you they're struggling, that usually means that they're struggling. And I think people don't often believe that. And so I think it's just so much of who I know Justin to be and how I know the world to exist is, is shaped through this mental health lens. And I think all those things contribute to the way I try to show up when I want to help foster teams. That's beautiful. Well, thank you so much for being here, Justin, and for spreading the light in so many different ways. I, this is, you are so good at asking questions. I really enjoyed this. <laughs> no, I loved it. I thought you did a really, really nice job. Well, thank you.